Please now let us uh, welcome Reporters Without Borders. And we have Lucie Morillon and Grégoire Pouget. Please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you, guys. Sorry again for the technical problems, but I think we're, we're all good now. Um, I just wanted to tell you that it's a real pleasure for us to be at the CCC. It's the first time that Reporters Without Borders is officially represented here. Of course, we have members and supporters who come uh, very often, but uh, it's the first time that we are officially here, and uh, we want to thank the CCC organizers for uh, giving us the floor today and for giving us the opportunity to um, reach out to you guys and to speak before a um, slightly different audience to, from which we are usually, usually used. So, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about uh, Reporters Without Borders, because you probably wonder what, you know, what Reporters Without Borders is doing here, what is a bunch of journalists here. Um, we are journalists, of course, but we are also activists, activists of freedom of expression, and I think that's also the case for many of you in this room, and that's why we are here today. Uh, we want to tell you more about what we do, what we plan to do, and what we, we may be able to do uh, together. Um, Reporters Without Borders, as you may know or not, is an international press freedom organization. We'll come later on to where we are based, what our, our network, and so on. Um, but one important thing that uh, you need to know now is that um, our activity is really to defend freedom of information, um, we believe that what we do is not only to support uh, journalists, but to support everyone that is involved in the business of spreading the news. And uh, we really, what we do is not supporting only journalists, but it's supporting everyone's right to be informed, my right to be informed, your right to be, to be informed. Um, we have, the mandate of the organization has, of course, evolved. Uh, we were created in 1985, and at the very beginning, it was a bunch of reporters who would go to conflict areas, war zones, that were not covered well enough by the mainstream media. They would do some reports, they would come back and try to, uh, to give this report to uh, televisions, uh, newspapers, and so on. And uh, this lasted for a few years after the founders of the organization realized that the main issue was not really about foreign reporter go reporters going into these countries, but the real issue was how do you empower people in the countries to be able to report the news, to be able to let us know what is really going on. And they changed the mandate of the organization from basic reporting to actual support to local journalists who were trying to do their jobs in sometimes terrifying conditions. And uh, another evolution in our mandate is also the fact that we were basically more, working more with traditional journalists at the beginning. And now we also defend bloggers, netizens, people who are being arrested, harassed, or killed uh, for um, their activities, not only offline, but also online. So that has been a big change to uh, Reporters Without Borders actions, but I think it makes, it, it makes us much more relevant about the issue of freedom of information. Freedom of information is no longer something that belongs to a specific class of journalists, but it can be any of our business. And we've seen it in, in many countries uh, this past, uh, this past um, months, especially. So these are the three main chapters we look at, freedom of information and citizen issues. Then we look at reporters without borders resources and how you may want to get involved, hopefully. Um, why defend media freedom journalists and bloggers? That's what I was basically saying uh, earlier. Without a free information, no cause can be heard, no human rights violation can be reported. We work with a lot of local journalists who keep denouncing human rights abuses, corruption, a lot of issues that are very important to uh, their citizens in their countries. Um, and of course, that sounds pretty obvious, but people need accurate information to make some decision, wh whether it's on political, social, or economic, economic side. Um, here are some specific examples of information that has proved to be vital to the public. Um, the tainted baby formula scandal in China uh, revealed, was revealed after, it was revealed on the web after months of covering up by the authorities. Um, why? Because, you know, the story uh, could have broken right before the Olympic Games and it would have been terrible for China image. So the authorities preferred to cover this up and uh, we had several 
hundreds of thousands of babies were contaminated by this uh, tainted milk from San Lu. And, um, and you know, you see well, some of the bottles actually up there. And also, this is one example of a demonstration by a woman who lost her baby over there. And um, it's been amazing to see how, first of all, this entire thing has been covered up by the authorities and how people were trying to seek justice and to spread the news about this to prevent that more babies would be uh, contaminated, how they were also repressed, arrested by the authorities. So that was really uh, a, a big deal uh, to us. And it's, I think, a very telling example of what criminal censorship can, can be. Um, also other stories that are very important and to the public and that are of a lot of interest to, to netizens around the world. It's also corruption stories. I mean, uh, Navalny in Russia has, uh, has done a great work of denouncing a lot of corruption stories. Um, we've seen also uh, some cases of impunity denounced online thanks to netizens who didn't want to just let this go. Um, I'm thinking uh, of uh, China. I don't know if you're familiar with this example, but there was a, the son of a local official who was responsible for a deadly car accident. And uh, when he killed this, uh, this girl, he actually left the place uh, saying, uh, go ahead and try to arrest me. I'm Li Gong's son. And um, well, that was a terrible example of how some people can think they can do anything with impunity. But the netizens didn't let it go. And uh, online, the information spread. People were absolutely outraged. And, uh, and the, the guy who was responsible for the accident was eventually found and arrested. So that shows the power of, of the internet, the power of netizens when they come together and they decide to fight for a cause. Um, another sort of information that is vital to the public, maybe we, we, we talk a little less about it. I mean, there's this uh, tainted uh, formula, baby formula scandal, of course, but um, in Saudi Arabia, when uh, Saudi Eve or other <laughs> blogs that are um, being, uh, uh, let's say, held by women are uh, censored, it's not only a basic question of censorship, it's also a place where uh, questions linked to breast cancer, for instance, cannot be discussed. So this closing a website like Saudi Eve or trying to, to block it, to filter it, is also a way of preventing women to have access to uh, essential health issues information. Well, there are many other cases, but I will probably go to the next, um, next topic. Um, we've seen in 2011 uh, something pretty new. Uh, netizens were killed in Mexico because, of, uh, the, because they denounced or they covered organized crimes uh, issues. Um, I don't know for some of you who read Spanish, uh, this is one note that was left next to uh, one body of, uh, of one of his killed netizens. And it's basically uh, a message sent to this woman who was killed and also to all users of social networks to basically warn them about what could happen to them if they continue to cover what the cartels do online. That's a pretty strong message. It's not only journalists who are killed in Mexico now, it's also netizens and, and, and bloggers. Um, <clears throat> that actually leads us to, I don't know if you saw this uh, report, we published it on the 22nd of December. Um, these are key figures for uh, 2011. I, I'm gonna just do short, but uh, we try with our networks and so on to um, monitor and to assess as much as possible the extent of the censorship and of the attacks on journalists, bloggers, and so on. And these are the figures of journalists killed, kidnapped, arrested, attacked, and bloggers and netizens killed, arrested, attacked. And what, I mean, the general um, trend is that um, it's becoming more and more dangerous to spread information. You can see here, um, sorry, uh, oh, yeah, you can see it there. Um, there has been an increase in the number of journalists killed, specifically in Pakistan and Mexico, which are the two most dangerous countries for, for reporters. Um, but also you can see an amazing increase of the number of journalists and bloggers also arrested. For journalists, there were f more than 500 in 2010, and we more than 1,000 in 2011. So that's really uh, a, a, an incredible increase. And why is that? I mean, clearly this was linked to the Arab Spring. People went in the street. The story was in the street in 2011, and journalists, bloggers, net journalists who improvise themselves, citizens, sorry, who improvise themselves as journalists, uh, were targeted because they had to come down to report the news. 
and um, and uh, this is this is clearly not only because of the Arab Spring, but also because of all the protest movements that have inspired around the world. And also it's due to the brutal response of authorities of countries that were not directly affected by the Arab revolutions, but that uh, took some measures to strengthen the repression uh, in order to avoid um, the spreading of the movement. I'm, I'm thinking of China, of Vietnam. We have not talked about it as much as, as what happened in Egypt, Tunisia, um, but uh, clearly the repression has been very strong, uh, not only online with censorship of just mean revolution world and so on, but also uh, physically arresting a lot of journalists and netizens. I mean, China is before uh, Iran and Vietnam, the most, uh, the biggest prison for journalists worldwide today. Um, and actually, we have 129 netizens in jail as of today, and 171 journalists in jail. I mean, all of us for uh, informing ourselves. I'm, I'm thinking today especially of, uh, of uh, Nobel Peace Prize Liu Xiaobo, who is the only Nobel Peace Prize recipient in jail today. That's why we have actually our free Liu Xiaobo t-shirts, and you can find them online on our website. Um, we, do, uh, we do also think of Michael Nabil Sanad in Egypt. His health is very worrying today. He's been arrested earlier this year, and his only crime was to question the role of the army during the revolution in Egypt. So, that tells a lot about the situation today in the country. That was also one of the lessons we heard from 2011, also in 2010, the role of social networks as mobilization and news transmission tools. Anyone can, I mean, anyone was able to send information to cover the news, and we've seen here how traditional journalists had an interest in working with bloggers, netizens on the ground. I mean, how can you get today image from China, uh, uh, sorry, image from Syria, if you are uh, only working through traditional journalist networks? You can't. I mean, you have to be in touch with people on the ground. They are the ones who take risk, but they continue. They want us to tell the rest of the world. They want us to tell other Syrians and others in the region what is going on uh, so that there's a solution found today to, to, to the issue. And um, thanks, to, thanks to the internet, thanks to social networks, and thanks to these very courageous uh, journalists, uh, netizens, we, we are today able to follow up what, what is going on, to follow live the repression, the demonstrations, and it's something that is very new. Um, I remember in 2007 when the monks, uh, well, in, in, when we had the Saffron Revolution, the monks revolted in, in, uh, in Burma, and it was something that we were able to follow live. Uh, clearly, the repression was very strong, but uh, compared to what happened in 1988, where also the Burmese dissidents were very severely uh, repressed in, in Burma, we were at that time not able to get uh, live coverage, of course, and we received some footage, some images, but very few of them, and, and weeks or months after the bloody crackdown happened. So that's something that is not possible anymore today. And we, we've talked a lot. I, I didn't really like this uh, idea. I mean, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people were talking about Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution. I mean, clearly, they played a role as sandboxes. They helped spread the news and so on. But we shall not forget that these were before and, for, uh, and foremost in, in Tunisia, in Egypt. These, these were revolutions, human revolutions. We will have to make sure that the online mobilization was finding an offline echo to make things happen. And that, uh, well, yeah, we had really people going down in the streets, taking risks, being killed, being shot, because they wanted to change things. Um, so that's, we're just coming back quickly to the citizen journalists and, and the importance they have, especially in countries where the mainstream media are under the control of the government. Uh, these are the ones who uh, cover the news. Uh, it's thanks to some Vietnamese bloggers, for instance, that we are aware of the bauxite issue and the environmental problems it has caused in, in the country. You won't find that coverage in the official media. 
And um, you know, anyone can be a citizen journalist. You can be. <laughs> anyone can be. A blogger can be, of course, a citizen journalist, but also netizens, lawyers, human rights defenders. Uh, we've seen that there's a wide range of people that decided to step in and, and to, to help the flow of, <coughs> the flow of information. Sorry. And um, I mean, we're very humble about how the local people, the local journalists, the local bloggers are the ones who are really um, in danger, the ones who are taking the risk, and without them we, won't, we wouldn't be able to do anything. We try to provide them as much assistance as we can, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our activities. Um, the basic one, to be able to take action to defend online freedom, we need to have facts, we need to monitor on, uh, online free speech uh, and cyber censorship. So we do some fact-finding missions to different countries. In some countries, we go as journalists. In some countries, we go as an NGO. And in many countries, we just enter as tourists. We run the risk of being expelled, but that's not a lot compared to what the local journalists uh, do. We, well, some of my colleagues were recently in Libya, others in Mexico. Um, we try to be on the ground as much as we can so we can get reliable information. And uh, we try to be also very cautious about the local contacts we make or not when we decide it's too dangerous for, for the people there. Um, I just, this is a screenshot for, from our website, the internet chapter. Uh, just to give you an idea of what kind of, uh, of action we've taken recently. Um, in Democratic Republic of Congo, we denounced the blocking of SMS messaging during, I mean, just, just after the elections and the unrest that followed the contested re-election of, of Pre President Kabila. And it's very interesting. I don't know if I can see it here, but uh, let's see. We had an answer from, we, we wrote an open letter to the Interior Minister of uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. I don't know how many of you can speak or read French here, uh, but basically uh, he didn't like our, our letter, and the answer is pretty telling. Oh, we cannot see any, everything. Let me just briefly translate for those who don't understand. Um, is basically explaining that he's the one who took the decision to cut SMS messaging service, and uh, well, in consultation with other authorities in the country, and is saying that his mission is to guarantee public order and citizen security, and especially in these electoral uh, times um, that was violent and agitated, and um, he's saying that the government does not take any instructions or receive lessons from anyone, including Reporters Without Borders. And um, yeah, he's the only one to be able to assess uh, the opportunity of, of, of uh, conserving or uh, cancelling the measures he, he took. Uh, he's aware of the financial loss for companies, uh, especially uh, telephone telcos, uh, the population and the state itself. That's one of the issues we, we actually wanted to, to, uh, to highlight. And uh, he's saying that uh, next time we Next time you write to a minister or any other authority, we should use a more courteous and responsible language, and uh, he forbids us to, uh, to give him orders. So clearly, our, <laughs> our letter was not well received, but I think we were not the only one, of course, to denounce, to denounce uh, this situation, but I think that the fact that we, as an international organization, took a stand on this issue helped partly to um, um, to change and, and to restore the SMS service. We also um, welcome the release of, uh, of a blogger in Egypt, Mr. Abdel Fattah. Uh, we also published uh, so, uh, a press release about, uh, in China, some, another cyber dissident who was, who, who was going to jail. Uh, we had three cyber dissidents uh, who went to trial this week. Um, also in... It's very <laughs> We, we also publish uh, something about the Maldives, where um, a, a blogger was victim of religious intolerance. Um, we also relate the news about the release of, of uh, Hazan in, in Syria, um, and uh, also about Kazakhstan, when the communications were cut in one, in one part of the country that is uh, marked by unrest right now. We also denounce that. So that's, you know, you can see that we try to intervene in many countries, different cases, uh, to, to help the people we we defend. We also publish every year a list of the enemies of the internet. 
the new list is coming up on March 12, World Day Against Cyber Censorship. And uh, in March 2011, we had as enemies of the internet Saudi Arabia, Burma, China, North Korea, Cuba, Iran, Uzbekistan, Syria, Turkmenistan, and Vietnam. You can also see the list of the countries under surveillance, uh, where we have you know, Bahrain, Belarus, uh, Egypt, Eritrea, but also um, democratic countries such as France or Australia. I mean, I, I guess you all have in mind the three strikes law in France, which is one of the reasons why the country was was uh, on this list. Okay, I will have to, <laughs> to make it short. Um, so this is a map that um, uh, helps us visualize where these countries are. And clearly the new list is going to be updated uh, for, uh, for, this, uh, for this next World Day Against Cyber Censorship. Um, another thing that we do is very important is the advocacy work for jailed or harassed bloggers and media under pressure. So we can launch some awareness campaigns uh, or relay some campaigns that, are that do already exist. Like Razan Hazawi in, uh, in Syria, we did relay the campaign that was uh, uh, drafted by one of, uh, of her friends. For, for Liu Xiaobo, we, we also um, created a campaign and we tried to relay it uh, as much as possible. In, uh, in internationally. This is an example of an online demonstration we held in, um, online, actually, in 2009. We, we uh, offered people to actually choose which country they wanted to demonstrate in. Uh, this one is an example of Burma, and people would choose between different slogans. Um, so that's, what, that's it. We have a tourism campaign. I will put some material here for those who want uh, some postcards and so on. Um, I don't know if you can read the slogan from here, but uh, this is about Vietnam, and uh, it says, fuck human rights, book a vacation in Vietnam. The idea is not to call for a boycott of, of tourism in Vietnam, of course not, but we just want tourists to be aware uh, of what is going on in the country and how repressive the regime is. Um, this is also <laughs> one of our actions. Um, we have occupied embassies, uh, tourism agency in the past. We are usually arrested, but it doesn't last very long. Um, this is in front of the Syrian embassy. It's an action we took in uh, uh, last May for WordPress Freedom Day. And uh, we, as you can see, we launched some painting on the walls of the Syrian embassy in Paris. And the slogan wa was, uh, it's, not, um, it's not blood, but ink that should be spilled. So we are denouncing the arrest, the killings, and the, and the censorship happening in the country. It was very well covered by the media, and we got a good feedback from Syrian activists who were telling us that they needed more this kind of actions. Um, we all also provide financial, judicial, and material assistance to netizens, their families, media online. I think my colleague Grégoire will tell you more about it later. And this is also uh, in Haiti, a few days after the earthquake, uh, we were able to set up a media center for journalists and anyone who was in, interested in, in information sharing, and a mobile cyber cafe that was going from one camp to another so that refugees could have information. Uh, the idea was to support the relief efforts and, and continue to, to, to spread information about where to find water and you know, many other important issues. Um, we also, Gregor will tell you more about it, but we also provide training guides and tools to help defeat censorship and better understand online security. Uh, we also support online media and websites under pressure for reporting sensitive news. We have denounced the pressure against WikiLeaks uh, supporters um, and, and the treatment reserved to Bradley Manning. We also lobby government to, present, to prevent them from passing a dangerous law that could have some bad consequences for online free speech. And we raise awareness on corporate responsibility issues. I would have liked to have more time to talk about it, but I'm happy to continue this conversation later. We were among the first ones to denounce uh, Yahoo's involvement into the Shitao case in China, when Yahoo gave some information that helped sentence Shitao uh, to 10 years in jail. And we have done a lot of pressure on, on companies to uh, make sure that they would be held accountable for uh, their activities. We currently support the Global Online Freedom Act uh, that has been introduced in the US and hopefully uh, coming soon uh, a European version of this bill uh, with stronger, um, uh, let's say, stronger options for export control of material that can be used for surveillance in countries uh, where it's used against dissidents. Um, and um, just to give you an idea of uh, 
how much people work for us. Uh, we, our headquarters in Paris, it's about 30 people, but we can rely on a network of 140 correspondents worldwide. We have a network of partners, local organizations uh, in Belarus, in Democratic Republic of Congo, in Latin America. I mean, we have about 10 of us uh, local uh, organizations that work with us. We also work with other NGOs that are specialized on human rights and, and other issues. Um, and of course, we have on the ground contacts, activists, members of civil society, and so on. And we're currently developing a network uh, parallelly to this network of journalists correspondents. We want to develop a network of netizens correspondents for RSFNet. Um, for advocacy and lobbying, we also have representatives in Brussels and Washington and branches in 10 countries, plus a legal committee that helps us draft its policy, help us send observers to uh, bloggers and journalists trial. We also have some publications on North Korea, organized crime, a handbook for bloggers and cyber dissidents that need a serious updating. Uh, Gregoire will tell you about it. And here it is. Um, we're just going to tell you a little bit more about an upcoming project we have. And uh, I think we would like to get your help on this. Grégoire, is, um, and just to, to let you know, Grégoire is in charge of all our cyber censorship issues and specifically of this project he's going to tell you about. So, um, as Lucy explained, uh, Reporters Without Borders has been doing a lot of things, and um, we have been studying the censorship and cyber censorship uh, for now maybe more than 10 years. And uh, back in 2010, uh, in Paris, we created the first physical shelter dedicated uh, for bloggers and journalists. It was uh, basically a room in our uh, office in Paris with um, three different com computers, uh, and we set, we set it up on those computers uh, to our uh, specific VPN. We, there was a Firefox with the, uh, the, the, the fancy extension that helped you to remain anonymous uh, when you're going on the web. And, uh, in this shelter, we also um, we had a lot, many handbooks uh, we provided to people who came in the shelter, for example, um, security in the box or the, the, the very good uh, handbook how to bypass some cyber censorship. And um, so that's what we were doing in the, in the shelter. This was only a, a physical room. And uh, we decided to uh, to do more than that, because, uh, for example, if you are a blogger in uh, Iran or in China, uh, and if you need uh, to install Tor or VPN on your uh, computer, you can't just take the plane, uh, come to Paris, and ask a reporter without border. Okay, I need a guide, and uh, so we decided to move to to do to move on on the web. The first thing we decided to do is uh, actually it's a part of the evolution of our mandate. Uh, we we want to create a cyber shelter. What is a cyber shelter? It's, um, it's a website on which we're going to publish some sort of documents. For example, a blogger in China wants to publish something on his blog about the, 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 milk, uh, the, the, the milk case. Uh, he published this, he goes in jails, and the blog post is uh, erased from the web. What we are aiming to do is to get uh, the blog post that has been published and published this post on our website. So we are going to fetch and gather many documents like that and um, publish them and translate them because this is very important for us um, to explain that in China you can go to jail because you just uh, you just publish something on on milk. So we are going to translate those documents to publish them in Chinese, translate in French, in English, and we hope later in Arabia, in Burmese, in everything. So we have to find those documents, and how are we going to do? As Lucy explained, we have many people on the ground, uh, but we, we think that anyone can give us documents like that. So beside the website, there will be a kind of vault where people will be able to give us uh, documents that could be a picture, a video, a blog post, anything. And people will be able to give us those documents 
in, a, in an anonymous way. So when we have those documents, we're going to check what happened. We are going to uh, ask to our contacts on the ground uh, to tell more about uh, this specific case. And once we think everything is OK, we will publish this on the website. And if the author of the blog post wants to remain anonymous, because uh, he, will be, he will have more and more problems even if we publish the, his, uh, his post, we are going to act as an editor. We are going to assume the legal responsibility for what the guy has written, or for the picture he took, or for the video he did. And so there is a... Um, um, we want to raise awareness uh, on these cases, and we want to spread the word, because uh, for us, uh, the, 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 in, in an idealistic world, the guy who wrote on the milk in China, uh, his post has to be, um, has to be uh, if you're in China, you must, you must have access to this. So we are going to, to, to do technical stuff to, to spread our website. Uh, I mean, we are going to massively mirror our website. So we are working on that, actually. And we are going to need a lot of help. <laughs> In order to to uh, mirror our website and to to massive uh, to to copy all those documents, so um, we are also providing trainings, uh, as I told uh, just before. Uh, in our back in 2010, in the um, in our shelter, in our physical shelter, so we gave handbooks and different tools, and we explained to the people who came how they could use it. For example, there were a, a group of Iranian bloggers that was in Paris. They were in Paris, and we, 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 we um, helped them to, to discover the, the, those tools. And um, uh, last uh, March, on the 12th of March from this year, in Geneva, um, the Swiss section of Reporter Without Borders, uh, it marked in part, uh, with Telecomics, Hi guys, I don't know if you are, there are any of you in the, in the room. Um, they, they organized, it wasn't uh, actually training, but it was very, very um, interesting because it was an event where journalists and bloggers meet. Um, journalists need uh, circumvention tools. They need to, to protect their sources. So they need to know how they can do that. So they need technical skills, but journalists don't always have uh, those technical skills skills, and people like the guys from Telecomics, hackers, they do have that. So what they did in Geneva, they invited those two groups of, of people, and they, they, they make them meet and exchange. So that's what we're going to do more and more. For example, um, the, in, February, in February this year in Paris, uh, we will do this experience again uh, on the 25th of February. We are going to organize an event with journalists and hackers. And uh, if you are in Paris uh, on the 25th of February, you are very welcome. So during this event, we want uh, those people um, to exchange. And we want to, because there is a problem with uh, journalists, we want to, uh, um, to raise their um, awareness. Uh, we want to explain them that they really, really need to protect their sources. They can't just send email to uh, people on the ground uh, because email is not secure. Uh, they can't exchange uh, um, sensitive information. They have to know that if you are using, for example, uh, Skype, in some countries, Skype can be dangerous for the guy you're talking with. So we want to do that also. And um, so since we are talking about web, we had to, to put a, a lolcat image. Um, this is a, a whole project. Beside the cyber shelter, beside the trainings, uh, we also want to be able to provide to journalists and netizens and blockers, we want to be able to provide them uh, tools like uh, Tor, and we are working on our own anonymous uh, VPN, so uh, we want to provide that. We want to provide them the tools um, that could help them to be anonymous. So, for example, 
uh, we want to provide them live CD or live uh, Linux system on USB key. We want to spread handbooks and, uh, for example, true crypt tools or uh, the guide I mentioned on how to bypass uh, cyber censorship. And um, there's something we want to do. We want to uh, provide secure thing. During the, um, I don't know if you've seen that, during the last election in Russia, uh, there were many websites that has been under DDoS attacks. Uh, because the, the press, the paper in Russia, it, uh, the, all the different uh, uh, people were talking on the web. And the web was the only place where there were uh, free information. So websites went under DDoS attacks, and we want to be able to provide them uh, secure hosting. For example, we are going to mirror, uh, to set up many mirror for uh, a Russian website we are working with. Uh, this is going to happen in March, and we are already working on that. And uh, the last things uh, we want to do in this project is we, we have a specific budget, we have a specific fund in order to give dedicated grants for netizens and bloggers. Uh, with these grants, we are going to be able to buy them uh, computers or cell phones or, uh, for example, web server if, if they need more powerful uh, web servers in order to, to host their website or to host any, uh, any tools they can, they, can, they can work on. So in order to do that, uh, we, we are a small NGO. So we, we really need you. We need people like you who have technical skills in order to help us to set up Miro. We need um, people who know how to uh, raise uh, our visibility on, uh, on the internet, or the visibility of our campaign, or the, vis the visibility of the campaigns of our partners. We need also insiders in, um, in, such, in companies that cooperate with internet censorship. I, I, I don't want to mention the name, but you know, uh, the, you, you know some name of the companies I'm talking about. And we need whistleblowers. Uh, and then we need, because this is also something we're uh, working on, we need uh, the help of people who, of jurists, who could help us to monitor what, what is happening in different countries, and who could help us to to analyze the growing number of laws that regulate the internet and who could help us to, to, to make some different proposition to the country who want to, uh, to provide laws that are not very uh, good for the freedom uh, on the web. So, if you are a tech guy, <laughs> what we need? Uh, we need, uh, for example, we need to know how a country can um, organize its national network to, 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 to make the censorship more easily. So we need people on the ground who could help us to carry tests, or we need people who knows to, how to make an end map stuff or stuff like that. We also need um, to know which communication uh, tools are safe. Can we use Skype in China? So that's not a real question. Can we use uh, RSC? Uh, can we use Google Talk? Should we use PGP mails? Because uh, so in some cases, PGP can be dangerous because if, the only one, if you are the only one in China using PGP, so you're just uh, saying uh, the, government, the Chinese government, hey, I'm using uh, PGP and maybe my mail is dangerous. So come up to my house and pick me. So we need people who could help us to know which is the right tool for us uh, to communicate with our people on the ground. Uh, we also need um, people who could help us to, to, uh, to make a better handbooks. Because for example, I, I got it right here. Uh, as I told you, we are working on the internet since uh, more than 10 years, and we we have uh, many publications. For example, uh, in 2005, we, uh, we published this. This is handbooks for bloggers on cyber dissidents. And if you read it, there are many, many interesting things. But I think, for example, the, the, the third chapter is quite out to date. So we need people to help us to, to have better handbooks for, pe for the people that need that. Um, and if you have a server somewhere, 
in, if you want to help us for our cyber shelter project, or if you want to help us to to duplicate website that we have targeted, that we know that in next March in Russia we'll have many problems. We need people with server who can do a WGate or who can use a HTTP track or async. We need people uh, in order to mirror this website. And if you have any other ideas, just tell us. Um, So we need also um, skills because we have a lot of campaign and we are going to show you at the end of the, of the presentation our new campaign. Uh, so we need people who can help us to spread the word with those messages, with our messages or with the messages of uh, the other, pen, uh, other NGO we are working with. And even if you are about to launch a, a communication campaign, we can also help you. We, we have a network, we have people on the ground, uh, so we can help you. We need Twitter star or Facebook stars that, that could just publish uh, the, the messages on their walls or that could just tweet or retweet uh, our own messages. And, um, and I think that's it. <laughs> So let's see. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're coming to the end of this presentation because I think t time is running out. Uh, if you want to keep in touch with us, here is how, how you can. And you can, of course, come and talk to us after this presentation. Uh, and we're going to end with um, a campaign, a very short video campaign, less than one, than one minute, that uh, we wanted to show you. It's not finished yet, so don't be too rough <laughs> with us. Uh, it's a campaign that is uh, uh, on Syria, denouncing the surveillance, the arrest, and, and uh, the extent of the censorship, censorship in Syria. And it plays around the well-known uh, Siri application that uh, exists for iPhones. You will, you will understand once you see it. It's mm -hmm. still very slow. We have, I mean, we have some editing to do on the video. It's going to be launched next week, so it's not finished yet, but we really wanted to give you as a heads up and show you uh, the kind of, of campaign that, that we, we do. And we need technical skills for uh, <laughs> the computer. Uh, so, yeah, Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, in the meantime, while we're setting up the notebook to show the movie, if you have any questions, please walk up to the microphone, and I see there are people at the microphone already. So, um, we have no questions from the internet at this point. Can we please first start with the first question from over there? Um, hi again. Great talk. <clears throat> Concerning your... I, I'm over ah, here. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Concerning your, your call for participation at the end, um, there was this other talk at 11.30. Um, your revolution just got fumed, I think, um, which um, was done by a member of Telecomics and a member of Geeks Without Borders. And in a way, they just presented what, what you seem to, to need. So they mm -hmm. can provide, and they do provide, um, exactly that kind of technical assistance you're calling for. So I wonder whether you already tried to talk to them, or...? Yeah, we, we, and that's a great thing about the CCC, is you meet uh, a lot of people that work on similar issues, and we've made contact with a lot of people who are, as you say, involved in, in projects that are similar to ours, and, and we're definitely up for working together and see how we can channel all this energy and good work and good practices, because that's exactly what we're here for. So, yeah, we <laughs> thank you, and, and if others want to, to come and see us afterwards, we're, you know, we're happy to continue the conversation after the CCC, of course. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next question from over there, please. Hi. Uh, I wonder if you know about the Turkish journalist Ahmet Şık uh, and his book Imam's Army. Uh, he was preparing this book and he was put into prison and the prosecutor tried to confiscate all digital copies of the book draft. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result, it was leaked and published, uh, signed by several authors. And 
I thought you might be interested in uh, translating it for your shelter because it's available only in Turkish. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about a religious sect, Gülen sect in police department. Absolutely, that's exactly the kind of content that we would be interested in, in publishing and, and translating because, as uh, Gregor was saying before, uh, usually when, when we take action and we denounce uh, you know, the fact that a blogger was sent to jail for 10 years in Vietnam, you, the article itself doesn't make it to the general public, so we want to translate it, publish it. And regarding Turkey, we, we do a lot of work of monitoring. We have uh, several fact-finding missions. The last one was in, in September, I believe, um, because there's a lot of problems with, uh, with press freedom in the country and, and online freedom. So we follow very, very closely these issues and um, you know, this is a good idea for, for content publishing. So thank you. <laughs> okay. I'd say one question from over here and then we're going to show the movie. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm uh, one of the hackers of the Tor project. Oh. And um, so one thing that I've noticed is that many people in this space try to provide guides. So for example, Freedom House and Internews and all these other people. And one problem is that they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And so it's really important to not be like them. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to work with people who write the software, mm -hmm. but also to always reject proprietary software when it is used in places where people's lives are in danger. Mm -hmm. and also to follow the money to see why people advocate for certain things and to see which properties those things have. Mm -hmm. So using a VPN that's run by re uh, Reporters Without Borders in a place like Syria sounds like a death sentence to me, whereas it sounds perfectly fine for, say, the United States in certain cases. Mm -mm. And as far as all the technical questions about IRC or Google Talk or things like this, it's really difficult to know how those protocols can be safe in a world with data retention. And so for almost all of these things, the question is why not always anonymize those communication systems? Because it seems like data retention poses a threat, especially in the West, and especially if we are the support systems for people in so-called non-free countries, mm -hmm. because we will be incriminated for helping those people unharmed. Like the Syrian government actually reaches out to countries in the West and kills people in the West. So it's extremely important that people don't think that they're safe here simply because of that. So I wonder how will you engage um, the greater community to ensure that the guides you published are really peer reviewed and you don't repeat the mistakes of groups like the ones I mentioned? No, of course, I think it's a very important point to make. And thank you for making this point, because that's absolutely crucial. I think uh, we're very aware of that, and that's exactly why we come here, and when we're telling you we need to update this guide, we need your input, because, uh, of course, it's, 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 I mean, what is at stake is uh, people's lives and, and safety, so we're very aware of the, of, of, of the importance of, of, such, uh, of such tools and so on. Uh, we have very good contributors to uh, our uh, book, which is uh, really outdated, so that's why we need, we need your... We had Dan Gilmore, uh, uh, we had uh, Ethan Zuckerman, Nat Villeneuve, and people like this. Uh, so um, clearly this was written by people knew, who knew what they were talking about, and we want to continue this way. Um, so yeah, so please help us. And we're also very aware of um, the fact that one tool that can be used in one country can be absolutely de deadly in another one. So that's where we have a lot of educational work to do, and not only towards bloggers, but also towards journalists who work in, I mean, who work in safe countries, and when they go, um, on the ground, they uh, don't take all the precautionary measures they should take. So um, we, we're, gonna, we're working on it and we're going to try to see how we can indeed uh, explain that, that it's always a case-by-case -case situation, but that anonymizing everything is definitely uh, something important. And uh, in, our, uh, in our shelter in Paris, we have, uh, of course, a link to Tor. We have a lot of, of uh, you know, um, we, we try to make people very aware of what you do. I mean, it's already very, yeah, because <laughs> very famous, and you do an amazing, an amazing work, and we're happy to relay uh, what Tor does. But, uh, it's, it's not only about technical skills. We need people with real strong technical skills, and what we can do uh, as uh, people who have contact, we, we are in contact with journalists, we have to explain them that uh, those technical tools uh, they, are, they are here for a reason, and they should use those tools. And in different countries, you have to use different tools. So that's why we need feedback, and we can 
uh, give this feedback to journalists who are on the ground in those countries. And w one last thing, um, we are also aware of the fact that there are many good guys out there and they are available on our uh, cyber shelter, on our shelter in, in Paris, uh, you know, like Security in a Box and others that do, uh, have done also great, uh, great books. And um, the idea with our books is also to gather all these uh, important skills and knowledge. Uh, but what, we, what we're going to add also are testimonies from bloggers and journalists on the ground to explain exactly how they use this, this tool and how uh, it changes also, because that's going to be the challenge to keep it updated. And the, 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 the idea of, of making it a wiki is also to make sure that uh, it's going to be collaborative and it's going to be updated as much as possible. Because, I mean, you know that better than I do. Things change very, very fast online. Shall we... So, so sh shall we show you our... Company? So again, it's, it's pretty slow, so you will see... Some, you know, the rhythm is going to be improved, but at least just to give you an idea. It's good. It's extremely slow. We have to <laughs> improve our, our movie. Let's uh, also relance. Ah, c'est bien. Non, non, non. Okay, we have to launch it again. See. Pardon. Ça déjà passé. Uh, okay, I see. I think this is just a teaser. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, you will be able to see this movie. Uh, in Short video. next year, in at the beginning of the next year. Sorry for the problem. Okay. Well then, um, I'm sorry that we don't have time for any more questions. Sorry for the guys waiting at the microphones, um, but the Herald for the next talk is already there and asked me to stop at this point. Can I please ask you to use the feedback system for this talk, take out the trash even though you didn't take it in, and let's give a warm round of applause to both of you.